Let me know when. Yeah, I'm waiting on the, the thumbs up from upstairs. <laughs> Yeah, how about that? Well, I can't <laughs> <laughs> Have to have everybody stand up for a few minutes. <laughs> Who can play the piano? We can have, we can sing a song. Who wants to play the piano? Everybody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Get on to him. I think he got tech support on the phone now. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and get started, and they'll catch up to us in just a few minutes. So, you <laughs> so turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. This will be our, uh, this will be the last little section here in Luke 9, and then we'll just, we'll go, y'all, any guesses where we'll go next? Luke 10, that's right. <laughs> y'all are on top of things. Luke chapter 9, we'll start reading in verse 57. Uh, I'll give you a second to get turned over to there. And then we'll uh, look at these things from, from the Word of God. Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 57. The Bible says, And it came to pass that as they went in, in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at, my, at home at my house. Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. You know, this passage of Scripture, I'm sure we've seen it before, you've read through it, and you, maybe you've heard it taught before or something, but it, it seems harsh what Jesus is saying here when, he, when he's, he's talking about these people wanting to follow him, and he, his answers seem very, very hard, uh, very harsh and in, in, in no doubt, and we're going to Dig into it a little bit tonight and, and try to un, uncover what, what he's getting at here, uh, a true heart problem. So let's, let's start with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for uh, your word that we can study tonight. And I pray that you would just uh, allow us to learn from it. Lord, I pray that it would be something new and fresh, even if we've read or heard this passage before. I pray that you would just allow our hearts to... Uh, hear from the Word of God tonight, and that the Holy Spirit would just teach us from it. Lord, I just ask that you just bless our time together. Be with those that couldn't be with us and just minister to them. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so here is kind of one of those passages of Scripture that you don't really expect to hear Jesus saying the things he says, but like I said, we're going we're gonna to dig into it a little bit. I want to I make sure we understand, because on the surface it does, it sounds like it's, he's being very cold and rude, but there's a heart issue here. So he says in verse 57, And it came to pass, as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. 
He says, hey, wherever you go, I'm following you. I'll be with you no matter what. And then in verse 58, Jesus said unto him, <clears throat> Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He said, you know, there's a thing. You say you want to follow me. You say you want to be with me. But you know what? There's a comfort level you have to give up. That's what, this, that's what he's telling this first follower. He says, look, you want to follow me. You want to be with me. You want, you want to do these things you're saying. But yet, just know that I don't have a home. I don't, I don't have a comfortable bed for you to, to put you up in. I don't have a, something that you can really enjoy and something that's very comfortable. Because sometimes serving the Lord isn't comfortable, is it? Okay, so, so Jesus says to these guys, to this guy, he says, following you, follow, if you follow me, it's not going to be comfortable. Now, we're sitting, you guys are sitting on padded pews. We've got the heat adjusted or, or the air, whichever one it calls for. Uh, and, and it is fairly comfortable in here. And that's, that's a good thing. Nothing wrong with that. Jesus is not saying that if we follow him, we can't have comfort. But what he does say is that we've got to make sure that that's not our priority. Because this guy, Jesus, we've got to remember when, when he's walking this earth, he knows people's hearts, he knows their thoughts, he knows what's going on. And when, they, when this guy said he wants to follow him, whithersoever thou goest, Jesus went right to a matter apparently that was bad that was in that touched this touched his heart and said, "Hey, you know, birds of the air have nests, foxes have holes, but I don't have a place to lay my head at night. I can't offer you the comfort that you enjoy. So if you're willing to follow me, you know that sometimes it's not going to be comfortable. It's not going to be you know, cushioned. You know, I, I just got an, a, a new." new to me truck uh, a couple months ago and it is amazing how many comfort things there are in vehicles now y'all heard of the uh like at mine's an f-250 and they're you ever heard of them um rex probably has the they're called gentlemen's trucks these higher ones that the people they don't need a truck they don't need to pull anything uh it, it, they just want this gentleman's truck. And they'll have every, you ever heard it called bell and whistle? You know, every little comfort thing um, from uh, controls on the steering wheel for, for anything you can think of to uh, uh, heated seats. Yeah, so my truck doesn't have heated seats. And that was the one thing that Brandy was like, you really, are you sure? And I'm like, yes, I'm sure. I'm <laughs> It's not that big of a deal to me, but you know, uh, if you got cold buns, I guess you won't heat his eats. So, but it's that there, there's so many comfort things that we get to enjoy, and you know, there's nothing, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. If you have a vehicle that has heated seats or has, 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 uh, you name it, it's okay. But if that's our only heart's desire when it comes to to, to things that we're we're choosing in life, is that how does it please me? That's what Jesus is saying here. He says, you got to realize that comfort may go by the wayside to serve me. And so this guy, he says, he gives him the, the first, this first potential follower of Jesus was challenged about his comfort. You know, compare our cost to live for him and the cost, the ultimate cost that he paid for our sins. Think about that. You know, there's a cost that we feel like we have to pay to live for him, but, but look at what cost he paid so that we can live forever with him. It doesn't compare. It doesn't compare to uh, the, the cushions on the, on the pews here, you know, and, and what the thermostats are set on or what you continue to fill out, whatever comfort area you might be considering it doesn't compare to what Jesus did for us. This second guy says right here in verse 59, 
And he said, he pointed to another one, he said to another one, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Well, that sounds, that sounds uh, worthy, I guess you could say. It sounds like something that uh, should be entitled to. But you know, the, the passage doesn't say anything about how's his father doing. And Jesus, obviously knowing, he knows that the dad is not on his deathbed, the dad is not sick, the dad is not... It's just that part of, hey, as soon as my family is to a point that I feel like I could, I could let go, then I'll come follow you. And so it's putting, putting family first. Now, you hear that a lot in this world. You hear that, you know, put family first. And we, that is a very good uh, attribute to have our family first. But, you know, ultimately what happens if we put our family above God? And we say, Lord, I'll serve you as long as I can be with my family. Lord, I'll serve you if my family says it's okay. Lord, I'll serve you as long as it's okay with my family. You know, that's where we get our priorities wrong, but it's very difficult to get that right because we love our families. I love my wife. I love to be with my wife. I love my children. I love to be with them. But if I start placing being with my family over being with my father, my heavenly father, that's where he's saying, you know, he says, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. You know, that's the, it sounds harsh, but Jesus is not saying here, you know, forget your father, you need to follow me. He's saying, your heart just revealed that your number one priority is not, is not me. It's not preaching the kingdom of God. It's your family. And you need to put the kingdom of God first. You need to put the things of God first. And that's what he revealed about this second follower, was that he was, he was faced with a, dile a dilemma of loyalty and allegiance. Listen to uh, Matthew chapter 27. So... I spent all the last couple hours putting notes together on my iPad and was supposed to print them before I left the house. Uh, they're on my iPad at home, so we'll have a we'll, y'all will get the condensed version of what I can remember seeing on that screen as I put the notes together. Anyway, it's okay. But uh, Matthew chapter 22, and I had the, all these verses on that on the iPad too, so I could just read them straight through instead of flipping and, and telling stories while I flip the pages and those type of things. But Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 says, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Verse 40, On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Don't miss what he said there. Jesus said here in Matthew 22, when the, uh, when the, uh, the guy asked him, uh, he's actually tempting him. He said, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And Jesus is saying here that God has to be first. I would say, in general, we as the, the church, not necessarily the hardest Baptist church, but the church, fail at this. Because it's very, very, very easy to get caught up in whatever we want to be first. Uh, I can go, I'm going to go through a list here. It's not exhaustive. If I don't say your little thing, then don't think that you're not, oh, good, he didn't call mine out. But it can be work. You know, I, I'm self-employed. Rex is self-employed. Sometimes we don't get that option to just say, you know what, work's got to be put on hold because you've got to finish the job, you've got to pay the bills. 
but there is a time when we can, we can, and I'm not talking about me and him necessarily, but we as, as humans can put work where it's supposed to be priority wise. We, we, sometimes we put work, which is also like putting, uh, uh, like putting money ahead. We already talked about putting comfort ahead. How about entertainment? You know, people put entertainment, and, you, and entertainment is a big umbrella. You know, uh, there's a lot of travel ball teams that play on the weekends. Uh, they, they don't have the, you know, they miss church so that their kids can play baseball or, or softball or travel soccer. I think there is all these things so that they can get better. For what? Well, the hopes that they can get a college scholarship. And that's important. But is it more important than being in God's house? I'm not saying there's anything magical about this, but when you miss this, think about the pandemic. <clears throat> we all missed church for weeks on end because we, we, it couldn't be, it was out of our control. What changed? What was different? I know we had Facebook Live and eventually had drive-in services here at Hardison. But what was different? What, what did you miss? Fellowship. The, the worship was not as genuine because we didn't have the fellowship. You didn't get to see each other and share, share prayer requests and share stories and how did your day go. And It's essential. It's something that we need. And so when we start putting things ahead of God and excusing it away... For whatever reason, it can be a great excuse, right? But when we excuse it away, we're showing our heart. Listen to Proverbs 27 and 19. See, y'all are like, you should have had these marked. I did, remember? <laughs> Proverbs 27 19 says, As in water, face answereth to face, so the heart of man to man. Does that need any explanation? <laughs> I'm just picking. Don't answer that. Y'all are like, right. Okay. Let me read it again, then I'll explain it. As in water, face answereth to face, so the heart of man to man. In other words, he's saying here that when, remember, we're in Bible times. Uh, they, when, you looked in, when you look into a still a uh, body of water, what can you see? Your reflection. Okay, it's kind of like a mirror uh, to some degree. So as, as in water, you see your face. So the heart of man to man. Our heart is revealed to the Lord. He knows our heart. When we answer immediately like these three followers did, when they answer, oh, well, let me, let me, let me go bury my dad, my, my father, Oh, and we'll look at the third one in a second. We've already read it. Is oh well, what about you know? Let me let me go say goodbye to those in my house. That's the heart revealing what's what's truly in it, and that's where our priorities are. Listen to Proverbs chapter twenty, verse five. Counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. You know who that man of understanding is? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll draw it out. But we have to have our priorities right. Verse 6 says, Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. I mean, it ends with a, it's, it's a question mark there. But a faithful man who can find. You know, our hearts... Um, how many of y'all, how many of y'all watch Hallmark or have ever watched Hallmark? Okay, I mean, I have. It's okay, guys, you can raise your hands. But, you know, there's, a, there's movies, the movies they show on Hallmark, what is a famous line from Hallmark movies? Just follow your heart. That's in like every movie I've ever watched on Hallmark, you know, all two of them. But it's that part of follow your heart. That sounds great, doesn't it? Yeah, you should follow your heart. You know, the Bible says a heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? If we truly follow our heart, we'll do exactly what Jesus is confronting this, these potential followers of doing. Putting anything 
and everything else first, making any type of excuse not to follow him. Well, let me, let me uh, you know, you say we're not going to be staying at the Holiday Inn Express? I'm going to sleep in the back of my car? What? When I serve you? Uh, that's not very comfortable, Lord. Well, you say that you don't want me to hang around and wait for my, my pops to pass before I can come follow you? And then this, let's look at this last guy in, in Luke chapter 9. Here in verse 50, 61. And another said, and another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. That sounds very reasonable. Very reasonable. Hey, let me, let me go tell them by. Because I'm going to go serve you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to sleep with, on rocks. I'm, going to, I'm, going to, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not going to wait around for a loved one's the past, but I just want to follow you. But just let me go say goodbye first. And then look at what Jesus says. This is, it sounds harsh, but let's, let's un, unpack it a little bit. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. How many of you, when you're driving along and you're just, you're just, just going down the road or you, or you ride with somebody like this sometimes and they just go, man, look at that. Isn't that beautiful over there? And all of a sudden, you're, as you look, or sometimes they turn the opposite way and the vehicle starts veering off the road or across the, the, uh, the uh, center line or whatever. Why? Why does it do that? All right, if it does that when you're look, normally looking forward, this illustration doesn't work for you. But normally, when we've got our eyes on where we're going, we can stay the course. We can, we're focused on something. Um, sometimes when, when I cut grass, if I'm making like the first pass and I'm not up against, you know, or I want to make a straight shot, and then instead of letting the, you know, the terrain, kind of the edge of the field or whatever, make the path... I want to make a straight, straight shot, I'll, I'll put my eyes on something at the other end of the, the yard or the lot or whatever, and I'll just go straight to it. And I won't take my eyes off of it. And when I turn around and get ready to go back the other way, I'm surprised. It's a straight shot. It's impressive. Because I have my eyes on something, I was focused on something. But without fail, every time I've done that, and I put my eyes on something and I start going... And then something over here catches my eye, I just kind of go, what? And look back, I'm like, okay, I'm good. Then when I turn around and look back, there's a little, every time, there's a little whoop in the, in the grass cutting run. I'm like, well, we can make that go away. Because I'm not staying focused on what I should be staying focused on. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He says, you know, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. You've got to have the right parties. What's going to happen if that if he said, "Sure, go ahead and tell your family goodbye. I'll see you uh, in the next town in a few hours." Jesus knows that there's a big possibility that when this guy goes to say, "You know, I'm going to, honey, I love you, kids, I love you. I'll see you next time. I'll be back in a couple of weeks or whatever." What could possibly What could possibly happen? What do you think? They could, he could change his mind. Somebody, she could say, oh, but honey, I was cooking beef tips and rice for you tonight. Ooh, I wonder if I could catch up with him in the next town. You know, I mean, whatever. There might be something that somebody could talk him out of it. You know, we've got to, when, when we say we're going to follow the Lord, it doesn't mean, he, Jesus is not saying here, um, that we should not take care of our family. We should not be family people. Um, listen to First Timothy. Hang on. First Timothy five eight. And this is this debunks the thought that Jesus is saying we shouldn't take care of our family and whatnot. First Timothy five eight. Oh, that's four eight. But if any man provide not for his own. And especially for those of his own house, he hath de denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. 
Okay, so he's not saying, he's not contradicting this scripture and saying, don't, don't take care of your family, just, just you know, say, see you later, sayonara. But he's saying, where's your heart? Where's your, where are your priorities when it comes to serving Christ? And that's kind of, that's kind of our, our question. You know, the Israelites, uh, they struggle with this too. And in Numbers 14, there's another one. That, that's why I hesitated there because there's another passage that was on my notes that I remember it, but it's not on here, so I don't remember exactly where it's at. But in Numbers chapter 14, verses 2, 3, and 4, the Bible says, and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be, pray, should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return in, into Egypt. This is when, in this passage of Scripture, this is when uh, the, the ten, 10 or 12 spies went and, I think it was 12 spies, went and spied out the land. And 10 of them came back and said, Whoa, this is not a good idea. We're going to get creamed. Those guys are huge. We're the size of grasshoppers compared to the people in that land. There's no way we're going to live through this. But two of them said, But the Lord said... We can have it. This is our land. He promised it to us. He would, he would take care of us and make a way. And then they got all up in arms here in Numbers 14, and they said, you know, there's no way. Why did God bring us here just to kill us in the wilderness? What's his problem? Man, we, we, if we had just stayed in Egypt, if we had just not run off when, when Moses said, come on, let's go follow the Lord, we could have stayed in Egypt, and we could have been the slaves of the Egyptians, and we could have made straw, and we'd have been happy. No, and they would not have been happy because they were in bondage and in captivity. But our focus gets off of things. <clears throat> we struggle just a little bit. There's another passage of Scripture that tells us that we're supposed to be willing to give up whatever, whatever God asks us to. And in Genesis, uh, I forget the chapter, uh, it was in my other notes, is Abraham was called to... Do you remember what he was called to do? Sacrifice his only son. The promised son. The son that he was like 90 or 100 years old when he was born. Yeah, you heard that right. He was 100 years old and his wife was 90. And at this point, the kid's anywhere from 14 to 16 years old-ish, and God says, hey, Abraham, I want you to take Isaac and I want you to sacrifice him to me. And the Bible shows us no hesitation. It shows that Abraham just says the next morning they got up, they put um, wood on donkeys and they got the stuff and they made a three days journey into the wilderness. And, and somewhere along the journey, the, uh, you know, Isaac said, hey, Dad, so we've got the, we got the wood and we got the knife and stuff, but where's the, where's the sacrifice? Because he knew what they were going to do. And he said, the Lord will provide a sacrifice. The whole time he knows God's told him to go sacrifice his own son. I don't know if I could have made that journey. I don't know if I could, could have started off on that journey. If God asked me to sacrifice my own son. But we know the story. And it goes something like this. As they got up into the place where they were going to sacrifice, they left the donkeys behind, and they took the, all the, and, and the servants and stuff, and they went up the hill I'm on top of the mount, and he set up the altar, and he took his son, and he bound him up, and he laid him on that altar. And the Bible says that Abraham raised the knife, fixing to slaughter his own son, because that's what God told him to do. And y'all are going, wow, what kind of God is this? Hang in there. Plot twist in just a second. He pulls up the knife. He's about to slaughter his only son. And remember, the angel calls out to him and says, Abraham, Abraham. He calls him twice. 
stop. And about that time, remember what Abraham heard? The bat the in the bushes. <laughs> and he looks over, and there's a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. Why is that important? Why is it important that he's caught by his horns? Hmm? No? Because if he were caught in the thicket by anything else, would, wouldn't he have been cut up? Some He would have blemishes on him. But when you catch him by the horns... Remember, God, did, God required a perfect sacrifice. And God provided a perfect sacrifice to the, to the point that the ram was caught in the thicket by his horns that could handle the briars and things. So he didn't have cuts all over him. He didn't have cuts on his, on, under, his, under his armor, on his chest or stomach. And he went and he took that, that sheep, that, that ram, and he, and he sacrificed that instead of his son. But you know what Abraham was willing to do? He was willing to sacrifice his son. That's, that's awesome. That's huge. Where is our level of willingness to serve the Lord? And I'm using pronouns that include me because it's very, it's very heart-exposing when we think about what are we willing to sacrifice to serve him? Are we willing to say, Lord, I'll go, I'll do? Or are we like, I don't know. Is it going to be comfortable? Am I going to have to leave my family? Am I going to have to not do my duties as a, as a head of the household or whatnot? And that's, my, that's the due point for this evening. Are we, willing, are we willingly following Christ no matter the cost? And I put in parentheses, and I don't mean to be uh, presumptuous, but most likely not. Most likely we're kind of like, hmm. You mean, come to church and the AC's out and we'll have to sit outside or inside with the windows open? I'll just watch on Facebook. Uh, go, to church, go to the wilds in a van that doesn't have AC right now? Or come and, and, and just be uncomfortable? Uh, I think I'll check out the next church up the street. I want to be comfortable when I'm serving Him. Do we truly put God first? It's a good question. You know, Psalm tells us that we should ask God to search our heart. He already knows our heart, but He can search it and expose to us what's in our heart and allow Him to, to reveal what's in our heart so that we can make changes to be more like Him. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be together. Lord, I thank you for your word that we've been able to see this evening. That